Well, welcome to all. I'm certainly happy for the presence of each one, especially those of you that are visiting with us. We're thankful that you've come to be with us today. Uh, in the lesson of the hour, I'd like to continue with a series of lessons that we've had about once a month on the subject of influence and how we are to be salt and light, a letter for Christ, uh, how we're to have influence when we go to work and in our homes and with our children, with our mates. And uh, in lesson today, I'd like to talk about the use of our influence to save souls. Uh, specifically, it's one of the great works that has been given to the church is evangelism and to spread the gospel. We're to be a pillar in support of the truth. And uh, this lesson, more speaking of personal evangelism and our individual efforts to have an influence to win souls uh, out of sin and to the Lord Jesus Christ and God. And uh, in this, we'll look at imitating God and Christ. They, they seek souls. They want people saved. And if we're disciples of Christ, so should we. It is uh, to our good that we seek souls. It's wise for us to do so. It'll bless us and help us to stay faithful if we'll be conscious always about saving other people and trying to do what we can to influence them in the right way. Uh, we want to imitate the early disciples of Christ. We want to be the church of Christ in the world today that's identified with those early Christians and have a part of that same uh, safe state. And we want to act like they acted. We know they had great success in saving souls, and we want to be like them. We uh, can, uh, of course, have an influence through our giving and through uh, supporting the gospel is one of the ways in which we uh, share uh, the good news with other people and make an influence in this world. It's uh, when we cooperate with those that preach the gospel by supporting them and helping them in the things that they do. Uh, of course, uh, we want to be equipped uh, to win souls and put on the characteristics that we see in Christ and the apostles and others that were successful. We want to transform our thinking and conduct so that people will be able to listen to the things that we have to teach. Certainly, if you're going to have an influence, you have to have love. We need to pray for others and their salvation, sympathize with them. We've all uh, been saved by Jesus Christ from our sins, so we ought to be able to sympathize with sinners. And we need to study the Bible, make sure that what we're offering to people as a solution is in harmony with what the Word of God teaches. And uh, we need to be practicing giving uh, effort to try to reach the lost. And in the book of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 34, 16, God said, I will seek the lost and bring back the scattered and bind up the broken and strengthen the sick. So God is one that seeks the lost. And if our God does that and he's holy, 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 and we want to be sons and children of God, then we want to be like God and seek those that are lost. We sent Christ into the world. His great mission from God was to save. In 1 John 4 and verse 14, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So the apostles saw him. They know that that was his mission, that he was flesh and blood, and he came here to save the world. And uh, if that's his mission, then certainly that's his church's mission. That's every Christian's mission to try to seek and to save the lost as well. In Luke 19, 10, after he had called Zacchaeus down from that tree and said, I'm going to your house today, he was seeking the lost, wasn't he? And he said on that occasion, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And he brought salvation to Zacchaeus' house, even though he was a chief tax gatherer and collector. Uh, he also proved to be a son of Abraham, he believed. And the disciples, all of us, We've been studying about discipleship in our Bible class on, on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. And to be a disciple is to be like your master, to be like your teacher. That's our great goal. We can't go beyond him. He's too great to exceed what he does. But we want to be like him, and he is a soul winner. It is enough for the disciple to become like his teacher. And that's what we want to do. We're told in the Beatitudes, those things that are going to bring us spiritual blessings in the kingdom of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Well, 
what is a what is a peacemaker? He's somebody that goes out and tries to help people be saved, that they could be reconciled to God, that they could be at peace with one another. That we are, are people that are uh, greatly related to peace, sons of God, and try to have the qualities of God, and God seeks the lost. And so all of these things show that our life needs to be about soul winning. Uh, the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom that's given to us, and uh, it tells us what being a wise person is all about. It's being an influence for good on those that are around you. It says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who is wise wins souls. He draws people uh, because of his wisdom in God's word and the way that he practices the things that are right, that he also wins souls uh, to serve God. And we're told that in the future, uh, Daniel, of course, reveals, is revealed to him in visions what the future was going to hold for the Jewish people, that the, you know, the Babylonians were there, and then the Persians were going to come, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans would come, and then the kingdom of God would come, and what kind of people would be in the kingdom of God, what kind of people would be in those days? It says in Daniel 12:3. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So in the age of the gospel, it said people are going to shine like lights. They're going to have an influence to lead other people to God. And since that's what we're about, that's what we should be about, right? And this lesson is to encourage myself, encourage you, let's let's. Let's make sure we're influencing those around us to be saved and try to bring them to uh, salvation in Christ. Lead them to righteousness. Uh, we studied in lessons uh, a few weeks ago about uh, being the vine, that Jesus Christ is the true vine and his disciples are the branches. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. So all about uh, blessing ourselves when we think about others when we try to reach the lost we're, we're saving ourselves because that's how we stay in the vine is by bearing fruit for the Lord having an influence that's good now uh, discharging an obligation is the way the Apostle Paul looked at his efforts to spread the gospel he'd been shown great grace by being forgiven and now he had an obligation to all people to try to share that message with them are we any different than Paul? In Romans 1, 14 and 15, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. It's a good thing and a blessing uh, to share good news. And that's, that's what the gospel is, good news, about the salvation that Christ has brought and made available that we can have our sins forgiven and get reconciled to God and be able to have a hope of heaven. That's good news that we're all here celebrating and enjoying. But is it right for us to keep it to ourselves, or should we be working and looking for opportunities throughout the week that we might be able to share it with somebody else? In the book of Second Kings, it tells about a time when a great famine came on the city of Samaria, and uh, the people were reduced to the, the, the horrors of uh, famine inside the city. There was even cannibalism going on inside the city. And the lepers, of course, they couldn't live in the city. They lived on the outside. And they determined it was best to go over to the enemy camp because they were going to die. And so they went over to the enemy camp in the middle of the night. And the prophet had foretold that said, tomorrow at this time, why you'll have a... a Barley will be sold for one shekel, you know, a, a measure. And he said, uh, uh, let's see, what's the other bread? Uh, barley bread is going to be uh, two, two measures for a shekel. And people said, well, that can't happen if God opened up the heavens and poured down bread. That couldn't happen, one of the officials for the king said. And he says, well, you're going to see it, but you won't eat it. Well, in the night, God caused the noise to be heard in the enemy camp. And they thought the Hittites and the Egyptians were coming against them. And they fled out of the land and left their tents and their food 
and all of their provisions there while they were besieging the city. And these lepers go over looking for that, you know, to try to find some bread so they won't die, and they find the camp empty. Therefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their donkeys, even the camp just as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered one tent and ate and drank and carried uh, from there silver and gold and clothes and went and hid them. And they returned and entered another tent and carried from there also and went and hid them. And they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news, but we are keeping silent. If we wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they came and called to the gatekeeper of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Arameans, and behold, there was no one there, not the voice of a man, only the horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents just as they were. And the gatekeeper called and told it within the king's household. And the people went out of the city in such a rush to get the food. <laughs> They ran over the guy that said, well, God couldn't do that, right? That wouldn't happen. And he got trampled. But he said, if we don't tell this good news, we're out here. I can just see those lepers running around eating the food. <laughs> but all the people are starving in the city. We're here celebrating the Lord, aren't we, today? But there's people all around us that don't know the Lord. So, again, I'm talking to myself. I'm not just talking to you. All of us have an obligation to be thinking about other people and praying for them and trying to do what we can to set up Bible classes with people and share the gospel with them. Share the find. That's what the early disciples did, and we want to be disciples just like them. In John 1 and verses 40 through 46, one of the two who heard John speak, John the Baptist, said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, followed him. They followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, and he found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ, and he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John, and you shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. And the next day he purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, Follow me. And now Philip was from Bethsaida, of the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and in the law and also the prophets wrote. And Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, and Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. They had enthusiasm to share the find of Jesus Christ because of the great blessing they saw in him. He told Nathaniel he wasn't able maybe to convince him on his own, but he said, come and see. Maybe that's what you can do, is you can say, come and have a class. Come and worship with us. Come and hear a sermon. You know, that, that's something we can do to have an influence. In it. Uh, maybe uh, you're not feel skilled enough to delete the class or teach the person yourself, but have an influence. We're told in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, therefore those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. When Saul brought that persecution on the Jerusalem church, those people went out even though they had had to leave their homes and their hometown. They went out and taught everywhere they went to tell people about Jesus. The participating with an evangelist is certainly a way in which these uh, commands can be fulfilled and you can bear fruit. When you give and when you encourage gospel teaching and uh, uh, support gospel meetings and so on, that is a way that things are going to be registered to your account, that you're doing your part in sharing the gospel. We're told in Philippians 1, 3 through 5, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, talking to the Philippian church, always offering prayers with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. They had helped Paul in different ways to set up Bible classes and help him spread the gospel and giving him support in different ways. And all of that counted to their account. And when Paul was in prison in Rome, it was a church at Philippi, they sent money and a servant 
to go and help Paul in his imprisonment so he could go on spreading the word. And all of that rebounded to their account. That, that was part of their influence to win souls. You yourselves know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. And I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So part of, uh, part of it is, you know, trying to teach a class yourself, but it's also supporting others that will teach a class. That also is a way that you influence others to uh, uh, be saved. And there are certain qualities if we're going to win souls that we need to put on. Soul winning is a process that we're all trying to perform. Um, you know, it's not physical, but it's a mental process. It's a moral process that we equip ourselves for. So help uh, see the lost condition. Help people to see that, that there is a problem of sin that we all have. That's our root problem, and we're all sinners. We have all have fallen short, and we all need the Savior. Let's help equip ourselves to give people an understanding of God's plan that will get us out of sin and bring justification to us. And then excite people to want to obey that gospel and accept that salvation. Let's do what we can to persuade those that are around us to take the step they need to take to be saved. Help one express that desire to be right with God in action by being baptized into Christ. That's what we need. And change their view, their affections, their will. It's what our goal is. So we're working on people's minds with the gospel and its arguments that it has to offer. Inspire confidence in yourself if you're going to be a soul winner. People won't listen to you if you don't live the proper kind of example of what the gospel is. So we all have to work on ourselves if we want to be soul winners and be confident that we're teaching what is true because we're devoted to study, that we're honest in the ways that we deal with the truth and deal with others. That we have pure motives in what we're trying to do. We're not trying to take from anyone, but we're wanting to share the good things that we have. Philip the evangelist, and uh, we could put Stephen in the same category, was one of the seven that was appointed by the apostles to wait on tables there in Jerusalem for the feeding of needy saints. And uh, they had certain qualities that also equipped them to be evangelists, to go out and share the good news. Philip is called the evangelist in Philippians 21 and verse 8 because he shared the good news. Well, what was Philip like? What was his basic qualities? Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputations, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. Well, they were men that had a good reputation with others. They behaved in a good and honest manner, in a proper way with other people. And that helped them as evangelists. They were full of the Spirit's influence, his teaching, and the mind of Christ. And they had wisdom. They knew how to deal with people, make this gospel acceptable to the minds of people, put their arguments together in a proper way, start where people were to take them to where they needed to go. They had common sense and tact and discretion and sound judgment as they approached people and dealt with objections to the gospel. So they were skilled in the practical application of the gospel. Well, we can work on all of those things day to day and pray about them, that we might do that better and be able to help others. So first of all, we've got to live the gospel to have an influence. Some people, it's all that you can do is your example, but that's an influence to win a soul. We're told about women that were married to unbelieving men. What should they do? They can't just nag them into obeying the gospel. They've got to live the gospel before them. Show that quiet, humble spirit that the gospel teaches us to have. And it can have a powerful influence to win them over to the good news that we are devoted to. In 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so 
that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. So we want to transform ourselves to be like Christ. He was lovely and attractive, and we want to be the same. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. So by looking at Jesus Christ in the Word, studying the life of Christ, putting on all of his characteristics, like we're looking at ourselves in a mirror, we're adjusting ourselves to what he's like, we uh, are transformed from glory to glory. Renew our minds, as it says in Romans 12. When we clean up our heart and our life, then we're fit to teach other people and have an influence on others. David committed comparable sin. He committed adultery. He, uh, he arranged really for the murder of uh, Bathsheba's husband, right? But he repented, and he told the Lord that if he could be forgiven and given a clean heart, he would teach sinners to come back to God. He got himself together. And then he could go to others. And that's what we need to do as well, to have an influence on souls. In Psalms 51, 10 through 13, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with the willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and the sinner will be converted to you. We've uh, all made mistakes in our lives. Some of us have made some serious mistakes. Get your life right with God and then do what David did. Use that bad experience to sympathize with other sinners and try to help them and convert them to the Lord. Use what's happened to you. Uh, our experiences in life empower us to reach different people. Love people, pray for people, study with people. I don't know this soul winning means anything if it's not coming out of love, right? <laughs> We're not really going to be successful at it if we don't love our neighbor as ourselves. That's what this soul winning is all about. What do our neighbor need more than anything else is to be right with God and to go to heaven. That's what they need above all. So let's pray like Paul did. He worked hard as an evangelist, was successful because his heart was in it. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Don't you think we'd be a more soul-winning group of people if in our prayers we always mentioned the lost out there we're wanting to reach? That that was on our minds? That's in our daily prayers? What you're thinking about and asking God for, you're going to be mindful when you meet somebody. You know, here is a possibility of somebody I can talk to and I can save. Here's somebody I can lead to Christ. I've been praying about that all the time. So now it's on my mind. I, I see everybody out there as a prospect when you're praying for them. Have sympathy and understanding. We're told about Ezekiel. He had to go to those exiles over there in Babylon and to preach to them. And he was to start off his ministry by going over there and just sitting among them and seeing what the circumstances were like. He spent seven days just sitting there silently, seeing the situation before he started his work. I sat there seven days where they were living. Well, we're living in this world. We ought to be able to put ourselves in other people's shoes, think about their circumstances, and have sympathy for them. We're to try to adapt ourselves to each person that we meet. We're not to be holier than thou and self-righteous. We're to be those that uh, are sinners, that have made mistakes ourselves and been saved, and now we're going to serve our Lord and Master Jesus Christ and try to reach people like he did. And uh, it's not about us. It's about that soul that we're trying to save. And that's the way Paul was so successful. Paul said, to the weak I become weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. So if I'm with Jews that are very strict, I follow all of the rules and regulations. If I'm with Gentiles, I'll sit down and eat with them things that uh, maybe a Jew wouldn't eat, right? Uh, I'd adapt myself to the circumstances, and my whole goal is I want to save this person. I want to lead them to Christ from where they're at. And uh, that should be our way as well. 
And again, we need to pray about wisdom in how to deal with people. We need to study different kinds of people and how to approach them. There are a lot of books written on personal work. I mean, there's a lot of work. Oh, but expert guys that baptize hundreds and thousands of people. That they've written books about how to approach people, how to answer their objections and so on. We could devote ourselves to building up a library of that. It says to the uh, it says conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders. You want to make practical use of your time, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Doesn't that show you know you're like somebody in business and you're wanting to seize an opportunity to build up your business and to get more customers and except you're in the soul business, right? And all of us are. We're we're trying to look for an opportunity and try how can I speak to this person to sell the gospel to them and why they need to obey Christ and be saved. So we're trying to take advantage of every opportunity to speak the right way and answer their objections. Try to overcome their prejudices that they have about the truth. Study the Bible is, of course, the most important thing of all, that we need to know the truth. We can't lead anybody in a way that is not that we're not walking and that's not right. If we're out just teaching religion and we're not teaching pure religion, we're not helping people, right? We want to bring them to the truth that's in the Word of God, the, the truth that Jesus has revealed through the apostles. So Timothy was told, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handing, handling the word of truth. So that's part of why we're here today. We'll be here Wednesday night. We're trying to equip ourselves so that we can be able to teach ourselves and others what to do and handle the Bible right. In 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you, to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet, with gentleness and reverence, keep yourself under control, humble. You're not rough and gruff with people. You're gentle with them. Showing reverence to God. You're, you're, try, you're representing Him when you talk to somebody. But you want to have that knowledge to give them an answer why you're a Christian. Why you think you should obey the ancient gospel the way that it was revealed in the beginning. Why you should practice the ancient order of things in worship and so on. We need to understand what it is and how to explain it. Give a defense for it. Lead others. Requires knowledge and proper knowledge. There's a lot of people trying to teach and influence people that don't and aren't careful about what they teach and how they've studied we're told in 1 Timothy 1, 7, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. We don't want to be that in that category, right? We want to study so we know what we're talking about. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind, and if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into it. Let's don't be blind guides. Let's know what we're talking about. Well, that's a load of... Uh, a load of scriptures that I've dumped on you there. <laughs> and on myself, I know it's a tall order for us all to live up to. We need to ask the Lord to help us to be mindful of others and their souls and do what we can to influence them for good. If we fall short, we need to repent and ask the Lord to forgive us of these things. But let's do better. Let's, let's, let's determine that we're going to spread the good news. Let's imitate God in Christ. Let's be blessed by acting wisely in regard to souls. Let's share the good news of the find we have, the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation. Let's imitate the early church and really be a church of Christ just like it was in the first century. Let's support the gospel. There's people preaching all around the world. Let's work to where we can support ourselves and spread the gospel in other places outside of this place. Equip ourselves with all of these qualities that we've talked about. If you're here this morning and you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ, as ambassadors of the Lord, we want to beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God loves you. He loves you so much and sought you out so much that he sent his son to die for you. He sent out the apostles into 
the world to spread the truth and to reveal that truth and to write it down for us in the New Testament so we could know how to come back home to it. Jesus said, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he that disbelieves shall be condemned. If you've not obeyed the gospel, won't you do so this morning? But as a child of God, you've not been walking in the way of influence like you should. Ask the Lord to forgive you. And then let's start doing the things the Lord tells us to do. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation in any way, won't you come as together we stand and say?